Hello and welcome to another Atypling Philosopher video with myself, Jonathan M.S. Pierce. This is the Ukraine War Update Extra, where I give you some extra nuggets and juicy information uh, over and above the map update I do earlier in the day. The map update I did this morning was quite a rush one. I had to I had other things on today and also not a lot of ha has happened. It's quite a, a few bits of stuff that's happened since then, but I'm not going to give you any of that map update now. I'll I'll save that for tomorrow morning, morning UK time. I'll, I'll try and give you, I've got so much to talk about now, but probably it's, it's a lot later in the day now. Uh, I'll probably try and split this into two maybe and do the rest tomorrow. See how we get on. Anyway, where should I start? Well, I was, uh, I told you the other day, I was given hassle by someone on the comments thread about, you know, these fires that are happening in Russia could just be an anomaly. That You've got no baseline. You can't prove that these are actual like sabotage and so on and so forth. And I and I presented uh, a counter argument to that to say, <laughs> actually, I've got pretty good reason to think that, uh, that um, sabotage is involved, especially since we literally have 54 cases of firebombing enlistment offices <laughs> of actual video footage as well with a lot of that of someone throwing Molotov cocktails. And then you've got things like, gunpowder factories and fireworks factories. I think back to the UK and think, how many times can I remember a fireworks or a gunpowder factory or a storage facility in the UK going up in flames? Uh, none, in, none that I can remember might have happened, but really few and far between. When this is, I don't know, maybe the third one in the last kind of month or two in, in, in Russia going up, and you're thinking, this... This is, there are coincidences and then there are there are extenuating circumstances which show this to be probably more than just a coincidence. Anyway, here's another potential coincidence. Another explosion in the gunpowder factory in Russia. This one happened. This one happened because this has happened before in Kotovsk near Tambov, around 450 kilometers southeast of Moscow. The fact it happened at 6 a.m. increases the likelihood of sabotage. No one was injured. The fire was quickly extinguished. It's just, just another example of, of stuff that is happening, of the the range of fires there's now as i said the other day a, a wikipedia page for unexplained fires uh, happening in in 2022 um all over russia in in certain places that look very much like sabotage but might not be but probably are anyway uh on to another bit of news so uh, just uh, as a result of i showed you earlier on uh, the footage of the the USVs, the unmanned sea vehicles, the drones of the sea that have done all that damage. Uh, well, I say all that damage. Slightly unsure of exactly how much damage. The Russians are being very quiet about this, just like they were when the Moskva went down. It didn't go down. It's being towed back to port and blah, blah, blah. And then suddenly, oh, it sunk. Um, you know, they only let things out of the bag when they have no other option. Uh, so in this case, we, we don't know what, what the details are with the probably three boats that were hit. Um, but uh, as a result of that, Russia says it's suspending participation in the UN and Turkey broker deal reached in July that allowed Ukraine to resume exporting grain from Black Sea ports. Some people say, and Zelensky said, that this has been coming, a long time coming. Russia are just, you know, looking for an excuse to do this. That may well be, but but it looks like they're doing that. So the UN says East Africa is on the brink of the worst famine for 40 years uh, due to drought. And Putin is literally killing Africans purely to try to bankrupt Ukraine. Russia's aggravations in Istanbul already ensure only a trickle of exports reach their destination. So it's already a problem, even with the Turkish agreement. Um and this is uh, Alexander Kuprikov saying, uh, under the WFP in UN and Akaria Angel loaded with 40,000 tonnes of grain was supposed to leave the Ukrainian port today. These foodstuffs were intended for Ethiopians that are on the verge of famine. But due to the blockage of the grain corridor by Russia, the export is impossible. Um, uh, so, yeah, and this is all supposedly as a result of the, the unmanned surface vehicles. Um, I call them sea vehicles, surface vehicles. Uh, they hit Admiral Makarov. So the, I've talked about how there's people proving that Makarov was one of the ones here and, and also um, a couple of other, uh, the minesweeper uh, and the uh, and, and another vessel as well. So here's, here's a, just a tweet saying that this is, you know, kind of proof that it was a Makarov. And in fact, that Yahoo article says, Sevastopol unmanned surface vehicles hit Admiral Makarov flagship of Russian Black Sea Fleet. So, the, and this is from uh, much earlier today, but at least three ships were hit um, in the attack. But there's some interesting uh, uh, points that came out, come out of this article. 
Um, so Geo confirmed uh, a bunch of people, investigators have analysed uh, footage from the unmanned surface vehicles, uh, which roamed the harbour and the sea near Sevastopol. So that's interesting. They did roam. There was kind of like one of them it seems to have done a, 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 a UE to try and find. So literally looking around for the right targets. Uh, amazing that, that they had the freedom to do that uh, to some extent uh, anyway. Um, so the investigators released footage of the attack on an Admiral Grigovich class frigate. They concluded that the Admiral Makarov is the only one that matches this description in the Black Sea. The footage stops when the USV hits the vessel and explodes. Another video suggests that the Ivan uh, Golubets uh, Natchez class minesweeper was also attacked. The Russian Ministry of uh, Defense said that the minesweeper sustained minor damage. One, oh, and it could well be minor damage. We just don't know. One of the videos shows the USV roaming among the docked ships in the harbor, possibly looking for a target the footage stops when the usv hits the vessel and likely explodes the footage suggests that the usv was positioned next to at least four vessels and had made almost a complete u-turn to carry out the attack uh, geo confirmed believes that all the available footage indicates that between six and eight usvs were deployed in the attack hitting at least three russian vessels and this is this is the, the bit that interests me is that wow there were that many at least six they reckon that were used um, so here they said more than six the USVs penetrated the Sevastopol Harbour defence and at least three strips, the ships were struck um, and uh, that's that's fascinating that they are they used that many and we, we saw one we think from the footage earlier I showed you it looked like one in CCTV camera footage uh, that was that was exploded in the sea probably hit by the helicopter finally because we there was that footage i showed you with one that was getting shot at by a helicopter anyway go and check my previous video out today or, or look on twitter there's plenty of um video footage of that on twitter i just didn't want to show it to you again um but yeah fascinating stuff it'll be really interesting to see what comes out once the dust settles here okay so um Let's now look at, I, I talked to you yesterday in my extra video um, about three bits of kit, uh, two of these MSTA um, self-propelled guns, uh, and sorry, my printer's going off on one, uh, so now it stopped. Um, so uh, two of these guns and, and a tank were blown up, and s uh, someone's saying that's seven million dollars worth of kit uh, now it turns out that not three but less no less than five of these um msta sm2 152 millimeters self-propelled guns so these are like cannons like artillery on tracks uh so they can move um were lost in luhansk but it's the fact that that is like five of those wiped out in one in one fell swoop is devastating loss for the russian army 12.5 million US dollars destroyed in a matter of moments. And this if this is this sort of thing's happening day in day out, the sheer volume of um mechanized equipment and artillery and all these bits and pieces that has been hit, the the, the massive degradation of capability uh of of the Russian forces is phenomenal, but it's phenomenal in terms of what the replacement cost of that is. So just th this video here represents $13 million worth of, of replacement value. That's, uh, so going forward, how long would it take Russia to actually get itself back on its feet after this war? No matter what the outcome of this war, Russia are taken out of, of you know, serious military threat worldwide and capability for a long time. And it's going to be hugely expensive to 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 get that back um so there's a dismissal of this colonel general alexander lapin it, as a commander of russian central military district district ugly stories are emerging about his treatment of mobilized soldiers he's said to have put his pistol to the head of a lieutenant and threatened to shoot him this is chris o on twitter this is a really interesting thread i don't know if i've really got time to read it all out but some of it is absolutely fascinating just shows you how terrible things are in the russian army and you know basically there were these guys that were just left to, to their own devices and then just absolutely pummeled by artillery and ended up having to sort of retreat and then they got uh so uh, so after they've retreated um I'll, I'll go to that part it saves all all reading of that um so uh, the fate after the ukrainian bombardment for seven hours um 
they were bombed with mortars. Uh, the major ordered them, as they told me, uh, to hold some hangar. They left there. Another company came. And again, the major said to occupy the hangar where the Ukrainian mortar was shelling. So uh, brilliant stupidity of the commander. Then at seven o'clock, this is all from uh, Russian source. We asked them, like, who are you? What are you? Where are you coming from? And they replied, the village is surrendered. There's hardly anyone there. Those who survived are hiding in the basement in school. Tanks are coming now. Uh, then there was an artillery bombardment, and we followed them. Basically, they hung out in 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 these in the basement of the school blah 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 um and then they uh several hours later late at night they reached they they then retreated from there uh the men were advised to leave uh, by a professional soldier a sergeant who told them if you want to live then go up the road there there are commands tracks and tanks there uh, they found only one tank as all the officers had already left on the trucks and walked to Svatova instead several hours later late at night they reached a gas station on the entrance at the entrance to Svatova probably the A3C station on the PO7 road just west of the town they were stopped by soldiers and prevented from going any further the men were made to sleep on pavements in the open so just get this right these guys have been ordered uh, to do like to, to basically ordered in to being bombarded like consistently for hours. And I don't give you all the details. I'll sort of rush onto this part, but it, uh, then they've had to retreat from there. They've come back. They've walked through the night to, to back to Svatova. Uh, and they're, they're then told by the people that meet them there, their own soldiers that they have to sleep on the pavements in the open. So Pavlov says uh, that, quote, since there were no officers and commanders, we set ourselves the task of finding the headquarters and asking about further actions. The commander of the 5th Company, uh, Lieutenant Dmitry Vodnev, went to look for officers but found only military policemen. So this is their guy, Vodnev, the guy that, you know, was in charge of them walking back. The men were not allowed to enter Svatova. Uh, after Vodnev told the military police about the retreat from uh, Kolomich, Chica, they informed Colonel General Lapin. So this is a guy that's just been dismissed. And this is why this story is coming out now, because this guy's been dismissed, but he's apparently overseen some pretty horrific treatment of his own troops. He went to the gas station to berate the surviving men who numbered around 50 to try to force them to return to the front line, because that's the way you get them to return and, and you know feel good about fighting for your homeland is just berate them. Uh, Pavlov writes, Colonel General Lapin put a gun to the head of Lieutenant Vodnev, demanding that we go back. And uh, he also threw a lot of insults at us, traitors, deserters, and a lot of swear words. Vodnev was taken away by Lapin's bodyguards for, quote, correction. According to Vodnev's father, the bodyguards, quote, tied his hands behind his back, took him somewhere and threw him face down on the ground, but did not beat him. His father says they began to threaten him, accuse him. Uh, they say they that he should not come back and insulted him. And then Lapin said, who's this, this guy that's just been dismissed, damn you and your family. His assistants filmed with a phone and they said, we will broadcast it to all. Um, show everyone in schools what you are. After that, Pavlov says they brought Vodnev in again to convince us to go back to the front. But he said, guys, I can't do that. Again, we were lined up parade style at the gas station in front of the checkpoint in Svatova. And there they began telling us, you are deserters, you are traitors to the motherland. Though they started with saying that we uh, did everything right. We retreated, we saved our lives. When they realised that we were not going to return to this place and just sit and wait for them to come, they started insulting us. A political officer named, so these are the, oh, what's the name, the commissariat, I think. The, the, the political officer named Colonel uh, Romyansev. Uh, also turned up uh, to try to motivate the men. We asked, at least give us something to eat and drink, Pavlov writes, to which Colonel uh, Rumyantsev uh, told us that people like us do not deserve to eat, drink or sleep. So these are soldiers who put their lives on the line, got bombarded uh, to the point where they just, it was stay there and die or or come back to Svatova. And they're saying you, you don't, you guys don't deserve to eat, drink, or sleep. Uh, the re-motivation quote: the re-motivation session uh, ended abruptly when Lapin's bodyguard spotted a hovering drone. The officers left hastily, leaving the mobilized men under the control of only uh, of two military police officers who were ordered to execute any man who stepped left, right, left or right out of the line. They did not see Vodnev again. He was taken away back across the Russian border to be imprisoned at the commandant's office in uh, Valyuki. 
he is reportedly facing possible charges of, quote, sabotaging military training. The next morning, after another night which men spent sleeping in the open air, Colonel Rum Yantsev arrived again in a state of alcoholic intoxication and started speaking in an abusive manner and verbally humiliating us, thus putting pressure on our psyche. Then, in the afternoon, he brought food and water. An hour later, Wagner PMC fighters came to us and also started insulting us, calling us traitors, cowards, deserters. The Wagner writes... Uh, pr persuaded two of the 423rd Regiment men to sign up with them instead. So they insult them, then sign two of these guys up to the Wagner. And the remainder were loaded onto two camads uh, and driven back to the Russian border near Belgorod, then taken to an army camp at uh, Alexeevka, where they were finally able to contact their relatives. The men are currently reported to be waiting a decision on their future. Some had medical conditions that meant they should not have been mobilised at all. So these are just mobilised troops sent to the front line. Their families are submitting appeals on their behalf while the men are hoping not to get sent back to Ukraine. So these guys were just sent to Ukraine after virtually, you know, no training and then, you know, almost you know, bombarded to death and then retreated back to Svatova and, and then were treated like that by, by the people in charge. So it's absolutely um, insane. Uh, but these are, you know, how it goes. Uh, the training, what they talk about the training, sorry, there are bits I missed and I probably should have read. Like many other Mobics, Vodnez men were not given a medical examination or combat training after being mobilised into the 423rd Yampolsky Motorised Rifle Regiment around the 22nd of September. They were given only one day's shooting practice at a military camp in Belgorod. Only a few days later, they were sent to Ukraine to defend a heavily contested section of the front line. Um, and uh, and that's, that's that. That is just insane. This is the Russian mobilisation insane and anyway here's so another little bit of comparison here so you get videos like this coming out all the time so the russian mobits given top of the bill weaponry so this is some There's russian guy complaining looping. about his his gun uh, as a mobilized troop because it is just so old that, that it doesn't even work anymore and he gets out the spring and you know shows that it's just it's it's not working uh, and this is this is what they have to deal with. I mean, I would never put a gun barrel down into the mud, by the way, because that's <laughs> never a good option. But anyway, he's just getting 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 out a uh, his spring and just basically saying this is absolute rubbish. This is this is what we've got. So he goes on to describe that, and then you look at here are some mobilized troops actually coming out on the on the line um, on the front line out of uh, out of an APC. Right, look at the helmet from like the second world war look at the gun look at the the, the uniform he's got the equipment he's got uh, and there you go this is this is a Rub russian mobilized soldier now i keep talking about these small details being so indicative and so representative of what's going on uh, all you need to look at is any video or any footage of ukrainian soldiers now not necessarily at the beginning of the war but now they have just so much better kit than they used to. Used to. So just look at look at this. This is just a little video of look at all the stuff they've got. Look at all of this. Look at look at the kit all of these guys have. This is just one you know tiny little example. I'm sure I could find more. Uh, let's go down here. Yeah, look at that. There's another one. Look at all this kit. Look at these guys just rammed with tech and just quality kit. Uh, here, um, that was that same video I think. Um, the, another one, I'm sure there's, yeah, something, this one here, just yeah, is a random video and you've got guys with, you know, proper kit all over the shop, just, uh, but it's these little glimpses of, these are just general Ukrainian fighting men just with a, a bunch of quality stuff on them. And then you compare that to these guys and that tells you so much it's it's concentrating on these finer details and seeing the pattern that they represent that i think is really really important um uh, and you know i fascinating and then let's take that one step further so here is an example of the russian camps and this has been a, famously pointed out um a lot over the last couple of months as the russian camps have been uh, captured by ukrainians moving forward the ukrainians come across places like this and are absolutely astounded 
So he, this is just the, the, the mess that is all over these Russian camps and, and they just can't believe them. Um, but there's loads of stuff like there's loads of footage like this that that shows you the absolutely terrible conditions they lived in that were I mean there was literally a pigsty there was a pig farm look at look at all that rubbish there's a pig farm that I, I saw them like occupying that was it was just I, I don't know how they could live like that uh, all these houses even when they take over houses they're just uh, just unbelievable these camps that they that they lived in um, and and how they lived it's just uh terrible but anyway that there's a lot of people who've commented on that saying this really shows a breakdown in command because if you've got quality command in charge of troops living in, in, at their living quarters you just don't have that if if you've got you know if you're observing orders tightly and if you're being closely um commanded and effectively commanded you you just don't live like that because it you know it represents how you are as a unit it represents how you maybe follow orders how you are looking after your own kit how you etc 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 so it's and then you compare here's here's a base that al jazeera are looking at in a, in a very interesting um little uh, so in segment they have but i just looked at this base and thought this and they might have cleaned up for the camera crew or whatever but this this seems to represent a huge difference between the two forces so this is in bakhmut okay and these guys are under a lot of pressure 100 meters of open space and when someone appears it is very noticeable there was a time when russians fired mortars machine guns and also snipers sure we answered them it's got his towel it's all hanging up there it's got, we've got... life is simple on the front line no mattresses here there's wood and a blanket this is our small almost family home there are the beds where we sleep, and afterwards we swap. We Look don't have equipment. hotel conditions where everyone has their own place. Someone's working, someone's on duty, and someone's resting. Here's my colleague resting now. Ukrainian troops face both Russian soldiers and troops from the self-declared Donetsk People's Republic, or DPR. Just a, a nice, a neat, using a lot of homely sort forward. of place that, that, that's effective we need more weapons. and it, I mean, it more allows them weapons. to operate as, a, as guns, a unit. But also high precision and is the Russians have been trying to push forward. In some places along this front line, the Russians are less than two kilometers away. The men here say they've seen intense fighting as Russian forces try to break through the Ukrainian front lines. The soldier spots a movement. Max points out to us that our flak jackets are useless here. Go through here? Easy. Yeah. Yeah. Easy. Easy. So again, look at everything here is just neat and tidy. Yes, you've got a few things around there, but this is like this is how a base should, or a camp should look and an encampment should look. And it's just I, I watched that. And, and I'm looking behind because I, I'm interested in what they have to say in the interview and everything. But I'm also interested in everything that I can see, just gleaning information from from a bit of footage that tells what does that tell me about these Ukrainian troops? And then I look at the footage of, of Russian camps and what does that tell me about the Russian troops? And you just got just worlds of different that that, that I think is is super important. And I, and I think it's uh, hopefully, I let me know if I'm just talking rubbish. But I think this is representative and interesting, and should tell you something. Okay, moving on to something completely different. This is uh, the the uh, twelve uh, Forbes article. Twelve thousand Russian troops were supposed to defend Kaliningrad. They went uh, to Ukraine to die. So Kaliningrad is the um, uh, this sort of area of Russian land. What's it called? An uh, an outclave isn't it, or something, rather an enclave, uh, but, or something like that. Uh, so it's Russian area here that is not connected to Russia, but they had 12, uh, a newly, uh, well, let's read you a little bit. Six years ago, the Russian army formed a new army corps whose job it would be to defend Kaliningrad, Russia's geographically separate outpost in the Baltic Sea between Poland and Lithuania. This year, the, when the war in Ukraine began so badly for Russia, the, the Kremlin yanked the 11th Army Corps from Kaliningrad and sent it to Ukraine, where the Ukraine army quickly destroyed it. 
Uh, and it goes on to give detail, but there, but here it's just interesting. But Russian forces were fragile and getting more fragile as the Ukrainian army rearmed with uh, American and Euro European artillery and rockets began plucking at Russian supply lines desperate for fresh troops. The Kremlin mobilized the 11th Army Corps, moving its ship and plane by ship and plane to Belgorod in southern Russia and into Ukraine near Kharkiv. Three months of grinding combat sapped the Corps' strength. Reuters got its hands on some of the 11th Army Corps paperwork, a spreadsheet dated August the 30th, so this is a good couple of months ago, right before a major Ukrainian counteroffensive indicated the Corps was at 71% of its full strength. So three in ten soldiers were dead or out of it. Some battalions, however, were down to just a tenth of their original manpower. It got worse for the Corps. In late August and early September, the Ukrainian armed forces launched twin counteroffensive east of Kharkiv and north of Kherson. The Kharkiv operation, sorry if I'm spitting at you, uh, involved a dozen eager Ukrainian brigades exposed profound weaknesses in the Russian forces in the area, including the 11th army corps tens of thousands of russians fled surrendered or died in place as ukrainian troops liberated a thousand square miles of kharkiv oblast in a heady two weeks the 11th army corps suffered more than most russian formations in the region in late september the center for strategic and international studies in washington dc described the corps as severely battered that may have been an understatement. The Ukrainian general staff concluded that the Corps lost 200 vehicles and half of its troops in the counteroffensive. It's possible the 11th Army Corps survives. If so, I mean, basically they're saying, we don't know where it is. It seems to have disappeared. It's... It it's arguably being obliterated and assimilated into other units. If so, it almost certainly will require many months to rest, re-equip and induct draftees in order to regain even a fraction of its former strength. The deployment and subsequent destruction of the 11th Army Corps is a tragedy for the men who suffered and died under its command and a terrible blow for the Russian war effort in Ukraine. But the implications extend across Europe. The 11th Army Corps was supposed to defend Kaliningrad and threaten NATO's eastern front. Now, it can do neither. So there are people literally calling on, like saying, well, actually, Kaliningrad is ripe for the picking. There's, they've just got no ability to defend that. Poland and Lithuania should march in. Of course, that would, you know, it's a hugely problematic move. But it goes to show the extent of the damage this war has done to Russian capability and capacity. Uh, that's an entire 12,000 strong army corps that appears no longer to, like, exist. Okay, moving uh, on to these M55 tanks. So these are based. These are tanks that are based on the T55, which is an old. This is before the T62. Okay, so this is between the T34 of the Second World War, if you like, and then uh, the T62 of the early 1960s. That then became the T, you know, T64, and then on T72, and then T80 uh, and 90. Um, so. The T-55 is a, an old tank that's no longer, like they haven't even pulled out T-55s for the Russians. But this is a really heavily modernized T-55 up to, I think, 1999. Um, and Slovenia has 28 of them that they've given to um, to uh, Ukraine. And in fact, they're already, so there's this, um, you know, footage of a train with them sort of, you know, there you've got 28 tanks going already they're already in ukraine now this is split people you get some analysts i know war in ukraine said this is just a complete waste of time these are t-55s what a load of rubbish basically essentially uh, and yes they are old but there's some people on the other side saying they've been completely modernized to the point that virtually nothing but the kind of chassis is the same you know they've got digital optics they've got like all this stuff yeah they haven't got the maybe the cannon of some of the other tanks but you know they've they've got they've been upgraded with everything else that, that effectively these are some somewhat useful tanks these these could could be useful online so uh, i guess you know as this guy says really interested to see how these perform you know it's an it's an open question i wouldn't be so close as to say these are useless but they're also not going to be the main battle tanks of of America or or the UK or Germany or whatever. But they are maybe somewhere in between, um, and you know maybe the Ukrainians will be happy to, to use these. Uh, I don't know how far that upgraded, modernized capability goes on these, but it's useful, I think. But I could be wrong um, because there, I've talked about this before. There's there's this danger of like everyone giving. Ukraine the rubbish that they don't want anymore 
It's like, oh, I didn't know what to do with this. No one wants to buy it. It's too old. And, and scrapping it is is quite a logistical difficulty. It could get us a bit of money in scrappage, but, oh, let's just give it to Ukraine. And then, A, we seem like we're really nice and we're supporting Ukraine, but really we're just getting rid of a whole load of tat. It could be that. So, you know, you can draw your own conclusion, I guess. Um, so lots of people seem to be it seems to be people giving stuff to ukraine at the moment is it's it's a good week or so for ukraine i would say italian i've talked about the italians giving these um other other pieces of kit where was it Are these 20 to 30 m 109 l self propelled artillery that have been promised and i was saying to you they've got what looks like a ukrainian flag on them it's not it's it's an, another insignia but some people are going oh there's an interesting they're giving these to ukraine they are giving them to ukraine but they're going to be modernized first before going there um so that's really useful 20 to 30 self-propelled guns is is good then there's uh maloney the new right-wing uh uh, PM of Italy saying that the two M270, so these are a bit like HIMARS, uh, multiple launch rocket rocket systems, um, and six Panzer Howitzer 2000s. Uh, so that is, that's useful. Those are, I mean, both are very useful. But then this next part, people are getting pretty excited about. So also Italy and France together have agreed to supply Ukraine with European anti-aircraft missile systems. Now these are apparently very, very good indeed. Um, I'm going to do a little bit more research on them, but uh, but there's a lot of people thinking this is a really good move for Ukraine uh, to receive these um, these systems. Uh, to help, uh, apparently they can go like Mac three, I think, uh, which is really very very quick, um, and decent bits of kit. Uh, so I'll, I'll I'll give you a little bit more information on them tomorrow in Ukraine War update extra video. But so expect that that's the Santi. Uh, hopefully, will will add to the um, surface to air missile capability they already have. Speaking of which. Nazams, oh no, uh, yeah, I'll come back to that. Nazams are almost in Ukraine. They're just finishing the training for them, and these are hugely impressive. Uh, the Norwegian or national um, it's, uh, um, surface to air missile systems uh, that uh, have been much vaunted and lauded recently, they are almost in Ukraine. So again, it's not just a case of giving Ukraine stuff. You've got to train them up, and that that's a bit that takes a long time. Um, and then uh, M109 A5 ACS of Austrian modernization was handed over by Latvia to serve in the armed forces. Latvia previously promised to hand over six out of 53 self-propelled howitzers, which were bought out of storage bases of the Austrian army. So um, this is, again, you know, they're getting given... Uh, more stuff here. These look like uh, SPG, self-propelled uh, guns, howitzers. So again, great to add to that the capability of of Ukraine. And now, as I keep saying, every week the the Ukrainians are being upgraded. And you look at their kit. Going back to the point about kit here, right? Every week they're being upgraded, whilst every week the Russians are being downgraded. OK, and it, this this asymmetry is continuing. It's not it's not there's 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 no way it's going to then come back into a balance unless someone like China suddenly gives Russia everything they want, which isn't going to happen. And so therefore, Russia having to scrabble around to to get really old stuff out there in storage or stuff from Belarus. And they are basically screwed as Ukraine gets given loads of funky stuff. Uh, and upgraded stuff and even if it's old it's not like a kalashnikov a rusting kalashnikov from 1950 so uh, this asymmetry is is a really important thing to continue to take note of because it 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 can only get worse for russia and it can only get better for ukraine and the only hope that russia has is just boots on the ground is just sending in poorly trained mobilized troops but that's the only thing they've got that, that can be a game changer apart from the drones. So the drones is where 
the Russians are causing Ukraine a lot of problem at the moment with the energy infrastructure. So that's been strategically very useful, even though I'd say it's a war crime. It, it, if, you, if you're taking yourself out of the emotive element, it's actually been an incredibly useful thing for Russia to do in terms of trying to debilitate and break Ukraine, although it just seems to galvanize their resolve even more and then gets the West to send loads more equipment. Uh, it's like, okay, we'll get you Nazams. Okay, we'll get you Sancti. Right. So, yes, there's the, I argued earlier that the better Ukraine do to destroy Russia, the more angry Putin gets and the more likely he's going to do something nuts like use nuclear or chemical which is like this paradox and i did a whole video on this paradox which is the better ukraine do the worse it gets from them in the end but you can also look at it from the other way around which is the the, the better russia do against ukraine the worse it is in the long run for russia because then the west just gives ukraine loads more stuff to deal with that so there there are these different paradoxes that are playing against each other um anyway that's me rabbiting on. Sorry. Next, a few bits here. So uh, again, this is doing the rounds. Uh, goodness me, is it Russians are looting? Just just looting in uh, Kherson here. I think broad daylight. That's what they're doing. Um, yeah, war crimes. Just it's what they're doing. Uh, this is an interesting bit of footage. There's four Su twenty four M flying together. These are Ukrainian fighter attack fighters so i don't know what their ground attack capability is or, or whether they're mainly just sort of air-to-air -air, uh, attack fighters um but uh you know it's just quite impressive seeing four of them flying all at once and also wondering what they would be doing um uh, but i'm sure someone can let me know that yes they can attack ground targets or are they just going hunting for other um aerial targets of the of the russians and lastly, um, this is just something randomly a bit different. Uh, so this is a mine clearer in action. And they just so it fires up some stuff. Look at all all this uh, kind of um, I don't know. Someone can tell me exactly how this works, but that's probably uh, so. The, it's then reversing here and it's fired that stuff light which is probably some kind of charges and then blows uh blows them up and that would i i i'm unsure whether that that's the mines that looks to me rather like that's the charges that they've just sent in there but the idea is that would blow up mines as well so you're using explosives to take out explosives um and yeah, it's pretty pretty devastating explosion. But anyway, I just thought that was interesting. It's just a pretty different thing, and you can see where it's where it lies there. That black stuff, you know, it's because it's got other things. I presume attached to it that 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 they, that they then send a charge and explode. Um, bang! You can see the shock wave. It's really interesting. That shock wave go across the field. So uh, yeah, that's um, listen to me like I'm some kind of 10-year-old kid. Um, sorry about that. I mean, it's war and it's horrible. But so, some of these things are just qu quite interesting from an objective point of view, just to say, wow, so that's how they... That's how they. It's not just someone walking around with a metal detector looking for mines in a field. You know, there are there are ways of, of detecting mines and, and getting rid of them. So this is the UR-77 Meteorit uh, Miklik clearing a, a minefield in Kherson or Blast. Anyway, I uh, hope that's of interest to you. That was just uh, my nuggets for you for today. Uh, please let me know what you think in the comments down below. Uh, please like, subscribe, share, and thank you for all your support. And if you fancy buying some stash, you can always pop along to uasupported.com forward slash ATP, and you can grab yourself a load of stuff that shows your support for... Um, for Ukraine. And uh, if you fancy a hat, you can get a beanie. For example, a beanie that looks like that. Various colours, uh, and that that is a Ukrainian design uh, to show you support. Anyway, my channel gets a tiny bit of commission for any purchases from uasupport.com forward slash ATP. So please, if you want to do that. Anyway, toodle pips. Thank you so much. See you tomorrow.